when we want to start, we we can. So, are you are you ready? Es gibt ein Problem. Ich, ich spreche kein Deutsch. Entschuldigen Sie, aber uh, ich muss uh, in Englisch uh, sprechen oder Italienisch. <laughs> okay. My name is Ricardo Rubini. I'm here because a uh, good colleague and friend Helmut invited me to to do this this lecture today. And we're gonna we're gonna speak and touch a little bit uh, generically the topic of reverse engineering. Many of you might not be familiar with this topic. Uh, many of you maybe heard about this, but they they never really touched it. And uh, it, it can be complicated to um, go in depth into the many possibilities that, that we have when we apply the concepts that we're going to see. Um, so I, I avoided to be very platform specific because what we're going to see can be adapted to mostly all platforms and uh, it's important actually to clarify some concepts because I think this would be more useful to you rather than just going into a, a session with crack me files and uh, cracking software applications uh, for uh, for example Windows or Mac OS X or the Android devices you know that these things actually are done I guess all of you know that people are out there reverse engineering and cracking software, but cracking software is not the only aspect uh, that that is important about reverse engineering. I would say it's only one of the many. We will see all the others which are much more useful to you because I guess all of you are young uh, programmers and you are starting your career. Eventually most of you uh, are already have uh, finished your studies here or some of you are still studying so it, it would be important for you to be introduced to these concepts so that you can make some use of them for your own career, your own purposes. So let's start to see a little bit what, what reverse engineering is. Uh, this definition can be found a little bit so everywhere. This is taken from Wikipedia, a little bit adapt. Reverse engineering is the process of discovering the technological principles of a device, object, or system through analysis of its structure, function, and operation. So it means that we have an object, for example, it could be even this bottle of water, and reverse engineering means that we have to understand how to drink water out of it. The water is an output, and um, yeah we have reverse engineering. But in our case, what we want to see is actually, most probably today, software applications and also hardware. Um, but our case in of interest would be compu a computer program normally because we are discussing IT today. Um, the program is taken apart and its workings in full or portions of it are analyzed. It depends what we want to do. It's not, sometimes it's not really worth to ana ana analyze the whole program. In the, uh, for example, let, let's imagine we want to reverse engineer how an application is actually uh, using certain network protocols. Uh, to understand this, it doesn't mean that we have to decompile and disassemble. We will see later what it means. A whole program. We only want to focus on uh, how uh, the, the network interface of the application uh, works. And this is what we're going to, for example, analyze because this is our specific case of interest. In other cases, uh, we might also need to analyze in full the, the application, the program or the system. And we will see an example of that. Um, so reverse engineering begins with a final product. We made the example of the bottle of water, but it could be a computer, it could be a, a, a CPU, it could be a software application. And it works backward to recreate the engineering concepts by analyzing the design of the system and the interrelationships inter of its components. By, by contrast, forward engineering is the construction of a technology by implementing typical engineering concepts and abstractions. When you are coding, when you are uh, writing an application, 
normally you are doing forward engineering. Reverse engineering is typically the opposite. We have already a software application and we want to understand how it works. Or we have a CPU and we want to copy it. Somebody did it. What are the possible legal use of reverse engineering? This is probably the most important thing because, uh, well, we have to focus on these ones rather than on the illegal ones. Because this actually can bring you some added value in your career. So, first off, one of the possible uses is we do reverse engineering because we want to understand how a product works more comprehensi comprehe comprehensively than just observing it. We want to go deep into the inner working of an application because maybe we want to develop something similar and we can learn from the work of others and uh, take some of these concepts and incorporate them in our own products. Sometimes we also use reverse engineering for investigating and correcting bugs and limitations in existing programs. Um, actually, I, I'm, I'm re recently I have been doing this. We have an application in, uh, where I work this application has been developed by uh, an engineer that is long gone. He's not been collaborating with, the, with our company for a long time. So we have this software application. We lack a, a, a lot of documentation. And uh, so when you want to implement your functions, how do you do that? Or when there are bugs, you have to reverse engineer it because you don't have the documentation. So normally a good way quick way, quick and dirty, is to execute the application, see where it fails, and you try to fix it starting from there, not starting from just randomly looking at the code. Uh, so you can correct bugs of, for example, applications where the documentation is lacking. Then you can also study the design principle of a product as a part of education engineering, and this is similar to the first point. Evaluate, evaluating one's own product to understand its limitations. This, this sentence is very simple, but it has many implications. For example, can our product be easily uh, broken or cracked or copied? Uh, this, these are limitations because it, mm, these days we, we also have to think about, think, uh, to think about Protect, protecting our own intellectual property because we invest time doing software and if we don't decide uh, to, to give the software to, for example, the open source community but actually we want to make um, a profit out of it which is equally fair we also have to think about how to protect our software also, reverse engineering can be useful to determine whether a third party has copied elements of one's, one's own technology. Imagine we have, um, we have made this software application and we release it to the market and at some point we uh, realize that there is another software product that is very similar to what we have done. And, uh, well, Many of the, the companies, what they are doing now, they are, for example, let's say, um, many cases over the years, what we can speak about, for example, um, the, the ongoing lawsuits between Nobel and Microsoft over the years, over DOS. A, a good deal of reverse engineering was made by the people at Nobel to understand what was going on, if, if some, some stuff was stolen from them and uh, vice versa. And also, uh, if you have ever followed this, this story, people at Novel were actually looking through reverse engineering inside the code of Windows 3.1, this is history of, of IT now, to understand whether um, Microsoft DOS had some kind of uh, advantage, unfair advantage, over other DOS uh, operating systems. And actually they found it, yeah, that it was true. There was a check, and uh, when uh, Windows was launched, 
to understand whether Windows was launched from uh, Microsoft DOS or from uh, DF DOS. And uh, if, if the DOS was not either IBM or Microsoft, Windows simply didn't, didn't work. And, um, and this discovery was made, of course, through reverse engineering. Reverse engineering also helps with the aiding with the documentation of the operational product, which a product that, for example, comes with poor or no documentation. It's the case we inherit some product, for example, in a company, and there is no documentation or the documentation is very poor. In, th in these cases, sometimes we are forced to go through reverse engineering. <coughs> we also can somehow uh, hack obsolete products into useful ones by adapting them to new systems and platforms. For example, um, IBM OS2 used to share the same uh, executable uh, format of uh, Windows 3.1. Borland Pascal uh, was able to produce code for Windows 3.1, uh, but not for OS2. Many crackers or hackers, or were, were, the concept is not the same, but let's say many reverse engineers uh, were, were ab able to modify slightly the, the header of this uh, new executable file to have Borland Pascal compile on uh, OS2. This was an application, for example, and Borland didn't complain about this. There was no legal issue, so that this hack is still available on the, on the internet. And also it is useful for uncovering the undocumented features of commercial products. This, this is also, you know, it, it is a case, uh, we can go back speaking about Microsoft because they have been doing these things for, for many years. Um, it's been very difficult sometimes for um, people uh, who are trying to get a better grasp on the APIs of Windows, for example, to understand why some Microsoft applications actually were faster than, uh, than theirs. The allegation go, uh, allegations go that actually Microsoft was using undocumented APIs of the operating system to gather m more speed in certain uh, areas of the operating system. This is of course all a topic about that the that it went really into lawsuits, trials, and uh, you can find a lot of stuff about this. But to reverse engineering, actually, the lawyers of the third party that felt damaged uh, were able to demonstrate that some unfair advantage was uh, on Microsoft's side when developing their, their own software. Uh, this is, I think, very important for you because I think that many of you are actually interested in, in open source and, uh, um, and uh, well, it, it really is the present and the, and the future in, uh, in, uh, of software development. You, we cannot really deny, when, when I was a kid, when I was young, I'm 33, almost 34 now, uh, open source, did, I don't remember it did exist. I was using the Amiga when I was 10 and I never heard about it starting hearing about these things much, much later. And Linux and uh, GNU and the open source community really changed now the, the way uh, IT is made, if you, if you think about how it was in the 80s. Let's take a look at this, because there are, we, we also see a, 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 an historical case scenario. <coughs> what is the clean room design approach? Clean room, clean room design, which is also known sometimes as, as the Chinese wall technique, is the method of, of copying a design by reverse engineering and then recreating it without infringing any of the copyrights and trade secrets associated with the original design. What do, does it mean in, in very... It means that we have, for example, a, a CPU. We decide that we want to copy it, but... We will use a way to do this, which now we will see, um, to, to make it so that we are not infringing any of the copyrights. The, the output of this system at the end will be the same or slightly different, but certainly compatible, 
but still we, we will not infringe any copyright. How is this possible? How is this made? We'll see in a, in a while. First off, let's see a case, some cases of um, reverse engineering made with the clean room approach. Reactus is an open source clone of Windows NT technology systems. Windows NT basically goes back to 1992 when uh, Microsoft and IBM parted away, maybe it was 1991. Um, Microsoft and IBM were developing together OS2. At some point, uh, they parted ways, and uh, Microsoft started developing OS2 3.0 NT. This is how it was called, which later became uh, Windows NT 3.51. Since then, basically, the, te the technology of Windows NT has been updated over the years, and now uh, Windows 7 and Windows 8, which are the current operating systems are still running on these concepts which, which go back to the early 90s. Reactus was made with the clean room approach. This is what the, the developers claim. We don't know really. I think many of you remember that at some point Windows NT4 code and uh, Windows 2000 code leaked and it was available on, on Pirate Bay and by the, the same time there was a boost in the in how reactors started to you know really exploded, but we we can only make allegations. They say that they did it with a clean room approach. So basically, they started over observing how Windows worked and try to make it starting from there, recreating it. Another one is FreeDOS. Maybe you have been using this. FreeDOS is an open source clone of uh, Microsoft Disk Operating System, which normally is known as DOS. Uh, even in this case, I have to say that Microsoft DOS 6.0 code is on the internet. Uh, this, this development exploded after this source code went into the wild. We can only allegate that they took a look at it, but we don't know. Actually, FreeDOS was starting already much before that. Now, this is certainly the last one almost certainly made with a clean room approach because this is a very old project which is called Wine. Most probably you have been using it on Linux or uh, Mac OS X for, run for running a few uh, uh, Windows applications. This is um, basically a compatibility layer which is capable of running Windows applications on several POSIX compliant operating systems such as Linux, Mac OS X and BSD. Basically, what one is, it's, as it says, a compatibility layer. The, the developers observe and try to recreate the Windows uh, APIs so that it was possible to have these applications running on POSIX compliant systems. And this date goes back to basically mid 90s. And now it's it's working pretty good. I, I would like to say, okay. Oh, this is uh, okay. Let's see the possible illegal uses of reverse engineering. Forcing operation of a system against the original intentions of its developer. For example, a shareware that now becomes a full commercial product. You can remove or disable features which are considered undesirable by a third party, and this is generally known as cracking. Or another legal use is literally copying existing copyrighted and or patented technology and implementing it in another product. This is what normally is called in industrial espionage. And it's also common in, mili in some military applications. Now we will see, probably most of you are too young to remember this. Uh, I own a couple of these computers. They are very nice. This is an IBM PC XT. And we're going back to really to the 80s. This is a famous case scenario of the, of the clean room approach. IBM versus Phoenix Limited. You have probably seen Fen something about Phoenix BIOS in your own computers. You remember about this. So where, where it comes from? What, what is this? So you can see these are the specifications of this computer. It was running on an 8088 CPU, so it was or 8086. 
the, the, the clones were running on the 8086. Actually, the 8088 was a little bit crippled compared to the bigger brother, the, the 8086, on the bus. But uh, anyway, we're talking about really the history of, of informatics here. <coughs> this company, Phoenix Technologies Limited, based in San Jose, wanted to produce, produce in the mid-1980s uh, a BIOS for personal computers that would be compatible with the IBM XT's proprietary, proprietary, proprietary one. Um, why? Because IBM, when IBM released this computer, it released it in, a, in an open way. So, it, I mean, the, the technology behind it was made, was made public. IBM thought it was a good idea because it would have made this computer successful, but actually it really backfired on them because people started building clones and, uh, and all the, the market started to be eroded because basically clones were much uh, more uh, cheap. They didn't work the same. So people really didn't see why spending more just to get a brand. It's more or less like when you know, your girlfriend asks you, ask you to buy a Gucci bag. You say, why well, the five euro one is not good enough? <laughs> So what is BIOS? BIOS is Basic Input Output System. It's basically uh, an operating system which is really uh, at a low level. And if it's normally stored in firmware, you probably you can see it in your own computers even today. And it's typically a ROM. And it's the operating system that takes over the computer when it starts up. So. The, uh, Phoenix wanted to sell an appeals to all these competitors who were making compatible uh, computer clones. And uh, to protect themselves against charges of having illegally copied this IBM's BIOS firmware, they reverse engineering it using the clean room or Chinese, Ch Chinese wall approach. How does it work? Now we can see it a little bit in detail. The first step, what they did was uh, they disassembled the code, which was around uh, 8 kilobytes. It, it, it is enough. It's not little. Uh, a team of engineers started studying this code, which was machine language code, of course, and they started to describe everything, uh, how did it work, all the possi possi possible relations between the input and the outputs, everything. Without using, but but without using or referencing any actual code, so they conceptualized what this uh, operating system was doing. They made a, a sketch, a concept. Phoenix then uh, recruited a second team of programmers, and they had really no no knowledge of what the IBM BIOS was, and they were never introduced to the code, so they never actually see. Uh, so the co the real code uh, behind this, and um, their work was to <coughs> take the concept and create this operating system. And what they did was, yeah, they they wrote a new BIOS. Did it work? Yes, it did work. Check for something like this on uh, on your motherboards. This is the BIOS. The, the BIOS is actually then was copied by order. You have heard certainly about America Megatrends, Ami BIOS, Phoenix BIOS. There are many. And the result, the resulting Phoenix BIOS was different from the IBM code, but for all intents and purposes, it, it operated identically. Phoenix began selling its BIOS to companies that then used it to create the first IBM compatible PC, PCs. And IBM was not that happy. What what did I, what did IBM do? IBM started to regret having made this open technology, the first PC. So in the, it was a desperate attempt to recapture control of the PC market, and they introduced a new proprietary architecture, MCA, which is stands for microchannel architecture. 
and they launched this new generation, which was actually the third generation of their computer, because we have the XT, the AT, and then we had the PS2 line. And uh, this, this line of computer had microchannel bus on it, and uh, it was proprietary, proprietary and uh, many of the specifications uh, were not divulged in any way to third parties. Um, for example, only Olivetti in Italy had a licensing for the microchannel architecture, but they had to pay a lot in, in licensing for making their own clones, which at the end didn't really pay off back to Olivetti. Um, and so basically it was, maybe that is the only case I can think of of another company using the MCA ar architecture. Needless to say, it didn't work because this technology is now dead. Now this is also another interesting fact. Another case of reverse engineering that is uh, useful to mention is this of the Soviet k 181 OBN86 chip, long, uh, really long uh, string, but this is really um, an analogous of the 8086. It came a little bit uh, late, let's say, because uh, the Soviet people in Soviet Union had to reverse engineer it. But this this coping of chip is not necessarily legal. One might, in fact, a person might take, a person or a company can take a chip which, and, and can create an analogous, something that does the same thing as an existing one. Think, for example, about AMD. When AMD started making uh, compatible computer chips, back in the 80s, when they started themselves cloning the 8086. Now, in the USSR, the, I think they had problems actually replicating the technology because they were a little bit back in terms of factories and uh, industrial processes. Was it illegal? USSR used to belong to the Universal Copyright Convention, but the rules were of US copyrights were not, could not be enforced in USSR. Now these cases could be, uh, for example, relevant to China. That's why we have all these clones of the Android devices. Soviet laws used to be, and still are in Russia, m much more lax on, copy on copyright. And, uh, and there have, have been many, many uh, United Nations cases uh, about this over the years. So the chips tend to be copyrighted rather than be patented. Because the, 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 the principles are well known, but each individual chip has its own layout, which is copyright. If you, if you take a look here, if we could open this thing, here we have basically the layout of the chip. It would be interesting to, to show you this, but you can see these things coming from here. <coughs> so this is actually where the layout is. And that is not the same as, as the 8086. Okay, so the clean room, or normally when we do reverse engineering, we use a four stages approach. First off, we identify the product or the company, component which would be reverse engineered. For example, this chip. Observing, all, then we, the second step, step is when we observe and disassemble the information, documenting how the original pro product works. And we start with the documentation. This was done also for the BIOS. Then we implement the technical data generated by reverse engineering in a replica or modified version of the original. Finally, the product hits the market. Let's see each case one by one. Identifying the product or component which would be reverse engineering. In the first stage in the process, sometimes called pre-screening, reverse engineers determine the candidate product for their project. Potential candidates for such a project include singular items, parts, components, units, sub-assemblies, some of which may contain many smaller parts sold as a single entity. So 
Have you heard also about the, the, the patent issues between uh, Apple and Samsung? It might be that some of these companies were reverse engineering portions of the hardware of the other. And uh, they, didn't they didn't reverse engineer everything. Maybe they were all interested in, let's say, how the Wi-Fi was working on, uh, on a certain device and doing something similar. And so we, we have to decide what is the, the portion that we want to, to disassemble. In the case of the, P the, of the PC XT, which was the system, it was decided to just take the BIOS. Then we, second step, observing or disassembling the information, documenting how the original product works. The second stage, disassembly or decompilation of the original product, is the most time-consuming aspect of the project. In this stage, reverse engineers attempt to construct a, a characterization of the system by accumulating all of the technical data and instructions of how the product, product works. If we have a software, this is the, the, the most time-consuming part. We will disassemble or decompile this, this software and we will start to make a sketch, a characterization, try to understand how it works. And uh, we will not, not make any reference to the actual source code we're seeing, because if we do so, the risk is uh, ending up doing something that is too similar, and so we can actually infringe some copyright, copyrights or some intellectual property. This is what we don't want. So this is our potential question. What is disassembly or decompilation of a computer software program? How many of you know this? Okay, say 50%. In the development of software, the source code in which programmers originally write is translated into object binary code. This translation is done with a computer pro program called an assembler or compiler, depending on the source code's language, such as Java, C++, or assembler, uh, assembly. Of course, if I'm, I'm coding in assembly, I will use an assembler. Um, if I'm using C++ or Java, I will use, a, for example, GCC, which is a compiler. Uh, some of, of these, GCC also includes uh, as far as I remember, an, uh, an assembler. So you can actually uh, include portions of assembly language. Uh, and this, a great deal of the original programs, uh, programmer's instruction, including commentary, notations, and specifications, are not included in the translation from source to object code. This is actually important. Why? Because when we are doing this translation, some of uh, the names that we use for functions, for methods, for classes, will end up in the uh, object code. Traces of this can be found there, and these are hints for reverse engineers. So when we talk later about how to protect a little bit better our software, we also see that it's a good idea not to leave too many of these hints. The assembly or the compilation reverses this process by reading the object code. So we start from the object code of the program and translating it back into the source code. By presenting the information in a computer language that a software program can understand, the reverse engineer can analyze the structure of the program and identify how it operates. Okay, you can save this link because this is probably the best software you can use on Windows, Linux or Mac OS X. This is IDA, the Interactive Disassembler from X-Rays. This product is very old. It's been bought by many, uh, at least a couple of companies. And uh, this is the state of the art in terms of disassembling uh, object code. The free version will support only a few of the many processors that the commercial one does. Uh, the commercial one basically can handle almost everything. 
and uh, and this is how it looks like. You can see this is basically what you get. It's an assembly code out of an uh, an object code. Here you will find some some of the the names of the methods, the classes, and the strings references. Here you can see the binary, the, the row binary. It also will be will build for you flowcharts and so on. I really recommend you to download a copy if you want to do some uh, if you want to play a little bit with reverse engineering. Then let's go to the third step in the clean room approach. Uh, implementing the technical data generated by reverse engineering in a replica or modified version of the original. In the third, this is the, the third stage when actually it's when Phoenix recruited the second team of engineers and they started creating <coughs> something from the sketches, from the characterization of the application from scratch. In this stage, um, you start to build a reconstruction of the original system. Engineers verify the accuracy and validity of their designs by testing the system, creating prototypes and experimenting the results. How these software applications are normally tested? How many of you are uh, familiar with the buggers? So most of you, how many of you have been using source level debuggers? How many of you have been using low level debuggers? I can count three. He's not sure. He, he did it and then he... You're. Okay, so some of you knows the difference. No. Okay. Go ahead. Basically, if you have a low level debugger, you will see just the assembly code and stuff. Yeah, this is, this, is clo this is close. Yeah, normally, source level debuggers are those we, we find in integrated development environments. And um, while the low level debugger really starts to, from, from the object code and from uh, a lower layer, layer of abstraction. So, source level debugger, it's a debugger that shows the program and the line or expression in the source code that resulted in a particular machine code instruction and so on. Basically, it means that when we, we have an integrated development environment, we, we have a debugger which shows which is the line, the, exactly the line uh, in the original source code language. This means that, for example, if you use GDB, you see the source code in... Uh, C++, for example. This is extremely useful. Imagine how time-consuming it might be doing the bugging of an application you own, the source code, in, uh, in assembly. Oh, a little bit too far. Low, a low-level debugger, it normally shows the line in the dis disassembly. These are some examples. You can check them out. This is actually the most famous one now, which is Oli Debug. It's developed by a German developer. This is actually the one that's been famous for over 20 years, Soft Ties, which now is not developed anymore. Sizer, this, this actually takes where Soft, soft Ties left. But I would recommend you to download only the bug, and we, we will see only the bug in, in action in a while. Finally, in the clean room approach, we have the final stage. It's when you will introduce your software, which is a replica of some, something else, to the market. The final stage of reverse engineering process is the, is the introduction of a new product into the marketplace. These new products are often innovations of the original product with competitive design, features of cap of ca or capabilities. Think, for example, of the, the, the ongoing war between Intel and AMD. At some, points in the at some point in the past, we also had Cyrix uh, participating in this race. Um, 
Well, AMD had some instruction sets which were specific of the AMD CPUs and, uh, and so in a way they were introducing some innovations to the original product. Uh, for example, NEC uh, created a version of the 8086 in the 80s which was called the V20 and it was much faster than the original uh, Intel CPU. So it was in, um, introducing some innovations. <coughs> These product, products might also be adaptations of the original product for use with other integrated systems such as different platforms or computer uh, of computer operating systems. Or, for example, that there could be adapt adaptations of software or even hardware to platform for which these softwares were not originally designed to. Okay, so now we can see a little bit of, this is the part two, uh, and also I will show you a debugger in action and um, a low level one, all the debug. Let's see a little bit the countermeasures and protection of intellectual property. Yeah. So okay. Let, let's let's yeah. Okay. Yeah yeah yeah. Let's let's yeah. It's better. Maybe you are tired of all these things. So, uh, so let, let's speak a little bit. It's probably illegal to copy the same thing, but it's legal to have this clean room. So. Do, do you mean yeah? It is legal, and also it is legal to uh, to disassemble uh, to decompile an application. That's a question because sometimes, like the license says, you must not decompile or have a look into it. You have to see. It, it depends. Uh, let's start off. Let's start by saying, where are you going to do this decompiling? It depends on the country you're doing that. For example, in Russia, it's not illegal. In China, it's not. Or maybe in Italy it's not as well. Um, I think it's not. Sometimes there are European laws that will enforce that because, I mean, uh, Austria and Italy, they are both part of the EU. I don't know if, if the countries of EFTA, for, exam for example, Norway, Liechtenstein and uh, Switzerland actually respect this law. So you have to check. Normally, uh, yeah, it is illegal, but how can they actually prove that you that you did it? <laughs> so yeah, it, it's a little bit difficult to prove it. And um, and if you if you use a clean room approach, they will never know it anyway. Yeah. Uh, well, the uh, Skype tried to do that. Um, Skype had some really low-level protection of their source code. Uh, and they, they really could prove that it was uh, reverse engineered. Well, maybe they didn't use a clean room approach, you know, uh, or maybe uh, sometimes there is also another thing. You have some patents on certain protocols, so maybe uh, uh, they were using uh, this protocol without, without any uh, licensing. And that's why this other company got busted. I don't know this detail, but we have also to think that some protocols actually are patented, so there is a patent, and uh, and some of them require some might require uh, licensing. So if the license is not paid, it is illegal to use certain uh, protocols. This is why this company maybe got in trouble. And this is also uh, I I was just reading the news that. Uh, a small company is claiming that uh, it has designed before Microsoft portions of the new Windows 8 interface and that they have a patent on that. So maybe <coughs> Microsoft didn't do any reverse engineering on that. But uh, now we're, we're touching um, another aspect which is these two things are so similar, they work, they work the same and they have no innovation. So. Uh, actually, it's really the same thing. The, the trick normally, and this has been used in uh, you, you, in Italy for um, at the back in the day of the Pentium 2 CPU. Uh, there was a small company close to where I come from, 
this is very odd, but it, it is true. They made a, a um, they, they were, it was known that you could <coughs> modify slightly the, the, the Celeron processor to make it like a full Pentium 2 CPU just by hacking it a little bit. And this company was buying directly portions uh, of cache memory from China at a, at a lower uh, price soldering them on the PCB of the uh, Celeron and uh, then selling this uh, processor with a new name it was called the B52 Genesis it was of course a hack it was some kind of co counterfeit product and so uh, there was a lawsuit by Intel thrown at this small company in Apulia, can you, can you imagine that? And uh, this company actually won the, the lawsuit because they said it's not the same product. We took a Celeron, we added something to it, we reverse engineered the concept, but we, there were some innovations, there were some changes. It is not the same thing. So if you really do the same thing, you can incur into some of these problems. But in that case, I, I think it was more on the, in terms of, uh, of patents of protocols, because somebody was using the same protocol of Skype, and since Skype makes money out of their own uh, intellectual property, they don't want their protocols to be used by free software. Any other question on this person? <coughs> Does the clean room approach uh, help you against pa uh, patents? Or if I re-engineer the, the, the same thing again, it's still patented because it does the same thing. You, you have to, to investigate this uh, beforehand, of course. The clear room approach certainly uh, make it so that it's very difficult to say that you uh, infringed a copyright. Copyright and patents are two different things. So uh, clean room approach certainly uh, helps you with the copyright aspect. With the patent one, not necessarily. So now many uh, companies are actually patenting uh, concepts rather than just relying on copyright for this reason. And so <coughs> these lawsuits that we're seeing are uh, a consequence of that. Any other questions? OK, let's move on. Have I have a question for you. How many of you are developers and you are actually you have ever rela released a software of your own? Many of you. And did you release this software as a commercial product or did you release it as uh, open source? <laughs> hmm? well, yes on both questions. Yes and yes. Okay, let's do it like this. Commercial. Okay. Open source. Both. Are you what about only three people? Huh? No, four. Does in house count? That's not easy. Uh, tell me some, something, did you notice that somebody actually tampered with your applications? They were cracked, something happened. They were not for probably this popular, <laughs> or well, it might happen that at some point, if you do something popular, somebody will try to defeat the protection behind it or try to copy uh, your application. Over the years, there have been many, many kind of uh, countermea countermeasures for protecting intellectual property. The most famous ones go back probably to the Apple II and Commodore 64 times. Back in the day, uh, you, uh, I think maybe you are too, too young for this. Some of you actually did use a Commodore 64. <laughs> okay, do you remember the copy protections of the day? Um, the, the most people, not many people had a floppy disk drive. But some of, most of us did, and the copy protection at the time was based on mostly on uh, on the hardware. Uh, how did it work? 
it works in a way that we really cannot replicate now with, with current uh, PCs because we, not, we don't rely anymore on floppy disks. Back in the day, a copier used to copy a floppy disk moving from the first track to the uh, 35th track of this floppy disk of the Commodore 64. If an error was found on the, on the magnetic surface, it would stop. It wouldn't continue copying. And so the whole process would fail. So the, the software companies started to implement this kind of trick. Fake magnetic errors on the surface so that copiers would reach the error and break, exit. And these were the first forms of, of copy protection. Then they became even more advanced. The, co the, the, the error was fake, but also it was a special error because you could have many different errors. And so the application was checking if there was an error and if this error was exactly what the program was expecting. And then they went even more advanced than that. Everything was on surfa surface media. And then the dongles came. Um, any of you make music here? And is, is uh, for example, has heard of the Pace E-Lock, I-Lock protection? For example, people who use Pro Tools know about these dongles, or those of you, of you uh, who use Cubase know about the Steinberg dongle. What is a dongle? It is a hardware protection that goes inside the computer and that prevents uh, un unauthorized execution of the of the software so this is the realm of really hardware protection hardware protection can be very effective but they also they have a burden because you you need to have this hardware to you this hardware might, might fail it can break and in the case of Steinberg uh, of Steinberg's dongle it's very complicated then to receive back another dongle with the license. Normally there is a license store in this. The first dongles used to use the parallel port, for example. Now the dongles for like iLock or um, Steinberg's dongle use the USB port. Then there are software protections. And we're going to see a little bit the software ones now because the hardware I, I believe that they are a little bit too expensive for you to, to implement unless you want to pay licensing to uh, Steinberg or Pace which develops iLock or other companies. Um, yeah, because they of course they sell their dongles and uh, as a software protection system and you have to pay a license for the, to them. Can you reverse engineer the dongles? Yeah, and it's been done. Um, a cracking group called H2O reversed the Steinberg dongle and they made an emulator out of it. And uh, it was completely reverse engineered. I, I took a look at, at it also. I shouldn't say it maybe on camera. I don't know. And yeah, they did an emulator. So they, they what, what they did was this. First they disassembled the code of Cubase. <coughs> then, with a debugger, they started seeing the interaction between the, soft, the, the software application and the hardware dongle, intercepting the communication between the two, and also seeing how the, the, the application behaved when making certain calls to the dongle. So they wrote down something like, uh, I remember it, it was more than a few decades, uh, a few, more than a dozen of these calls, they wrote them down, make a perfect emulation, they make a USB uh, sort of fake dongle emulator, and now all these calls were redirected to this driver and back to the application. The application didn't even notice that the, it was not the real dongle. So you can also reverse uh, hardware dongles and hardware protections. That made really uh, create a big problem for Steinberg and then I remember that this technology was actually sold because once you break a software, uh, a hardware protection like this, 
and uh, this becomes public, how can you ma market anymore this hardware protection as some, something that is valuable? It's been broken. And so, let's see the software side. How a commercial software product looks like. Normally, when we have a commercial product, when you, when you distribute your commercial product, it is released in the form of object code. So, the object code, as you know, consists of nu numeric codes specifying each of the computer instructions that must be executed, as well as the locations in memory of the data on which instructions are to operate. Source code is translated with the use of an assembler com of compiler into a language form that contains instructions to the computer known. And we already seen this uh, before. Source code of commercial products is generally non-available. You don't have, but there are some commercial software uh, products where you also have the. It depends on the licensing. There are some cases. Um, so object code should be normally is only targeted by low-level debuggers on the compilers. We don't have the source code of. And this is how people who would like to crack your software applications tomorrow uh, will do. They will deal with your object code. And they will start to try to break it from there. What can you really do to make it a little bit more difficult to, to break? We will focus on these four concepts. I, I see that some of you look very tired. <laughs> is, it, is it heavy? <laughs> so, we will focus on four of the most common techniques that are used and that you should investigate. And these are, pla are sometimes plat platform specific. That means if you are dealing with Windows, you have to investigate these things on Windows. If we are dealing with Android, you have to educate yourself on what are the, pack, the packers on Android, what are the debuggers available on Android, what are the decompilers. Okay, let's start off with encryption. How many of you uh, are familiar with encryption and cryptology? But maybe you did some course here. Uh, yeah? We had yeah. The most common way to protect that data is to perform encryption. This goes back really to now. These these things are really available to us, but you have to to start thinking that if we go back in in time. Well, am I going to too late? Maybe. How much time we have left? Uh, what one minute? <laughs> yeah, you you have to speak after me. Yeah, I'm after you. Please, because please, because please. we started a little bit late, I guess 15 minutes late, so I will steal you 15 minutes. It's okay. Uh, I'll have it. Okay. Thanks. So nowadays in electronic commerce, encryption is already a prerequisite. A prerequisite. So you, you know that we are using already encryption when we are transferring data back and forth from servers. After encryption, the code will be then immune to normal disassembling and decompiling. Let's let's see an example. So, how many of you know a little bit of assembly? Okay. So this is not scary for you, I guess. No. This is the the XOR cipher. Why the XOR cipher is so uh, interesting? Well, because of how it works. If you have plain text XOR key, you get the cipher text, which is basically the encrypted uh, text or source code. When you have the cipher text and you XOR it against the key, you go back to the plain text. So the XOR cipher was extremely uh, popular in the days of uh, DOS computer viruses. And uh, the majority of those computer viruses were implementing exactly this. Com infector, exe infectors were using this to hide the payload of the virus. 
may maybe some of you are not familiar on uh, with this. This is old technology, really. But a com file was like 64k of code like this, starting at. So what you had was this object code. Uh, a, a common factor would work like this. It would add a jump at the beginning of the com file, add its payload here, and so when it was executed, the, 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 the virus would take over, substitute in memory the first three bytes, of the jump because a jump instruction uh, used three bytes and uh, and then infect another com this is normally a com infector infect another com file substitute the jump here and then jump back and execute the com as it was why is this important? Because this, this portion of the code originally was uh, clean. It was in plain text. So antivirus software only took, for example, a portion of the code that was significant of this uh, virus and were able, like a simple grep com command, to find the virus into the com files and say, okay, this is infected and it was sufficient to uh, clear this first jump so that this was not executed this was deleted and uh, and the com was cleaned out of the of the virus so virus uh, virus uh, the, the, the coders who made this decided that they wanted to do something better so the jump was always here Let's simply speak with the com about com infector because it's easier. The jump was always here, but actually this thing looked a little bit different. You would have this, which is our XOR cipher, and then cipher text here. So what did happen? That you have a jump to the XOR cipher, and the payload of the of the virus was encrypted. So you couldn't do uh, any more uh, a grab command. Why? Because the key was always changing, and the new key was stored into every com. There was a new key. But if you want to do a grab command, where do you do it now? For example, you well, you, you would do it on the XOR cipher. So then you can change this code a little bit and have what was called back in the day uh, have mutation of, of, of the of the virus, and there were mutation in genes because uh, it worked like making impossible to take a string to be searched against each executa executable file by adding garbage to this code because if we leave it clean like this we will have an object code which will be always the same what if we start to add garbage here for example uh, adding one then subtracting one stuff that doesn't do anything but it's just make it different so this was very uh, popular. How does it work? Let's see. Uh, we already said that the advantage is plain text. Here we have more. This, this is the accumulator. So, this application, what it does is it moves the address of the of the data we want to encrypt <coughs> into the accumulator. Then, in the CX register, we have. The, the size of this data and then we have the key and then you have a loop this is very easy to implement also in C++ and it could be a good idea to actually cipher your strings because we will see that a very common 
uh, approach is to look strings into an executable file to crack it. We'll see it in, uh, I hope, five minutes. OK, then there is packing. Packing was originally designed for compressing an executable file to gain disk space, because the original data is scrambled by the compression algorithm. Excuse me, so when was uh, like this XOR or something like that? Or would you still use it today? Well, it was never state of the art. Actually, it was very simple to implement. And the advantage was, yeah, that it is, it, it's extreme, extremely simple, but it can take uh, out of your business many uh, unexperienced people. Because if you, I, I, you will see why in, in, in a few minutes. Uh, I understand that. I remember if it was already there in the 80s. Yeah, yeah, of course. It's, it's quite old. But it's still effective. It, it still works. It is a, a little uh, technique that you can use to hide your strings in your applications so that crackers cannot understand, for example, when you have wrong password or good password. Uh, we'll see it in, uh, in a few minutes. So packing was, was designed to compress uh, executables. Uh, this was very uh, popular back in the day of the P IBM PC XT because you had this floppy disk and so the space was very limited. But it's still used now as a form of protection. How does it work? This is uh, maybe could be a little bit complicated. But I really uh, <coughs> recommend you to check out UPX. This is uh, basically the, uh, uh, the packer. It, it is open source, so you can also see how it works. This is a packer for executables on Windows. This is how a PE, PE stands for portable executable. This is the format uh, for Windows 32-bit uh, executables. Looks like this. You have the header. This contains information about the executable. You have the code section, and you have the data section. What UPX does, it, it, it transforms the file into this. You have the header, UPX0, UPX1, and then stub code. And then you see what happens when it is executed. A portion of this will be executed, which is this. It will then uncompress in memory uh, a portion of this application. So what is important for us really is not to understand how a packer works today, but the fact that by uh, implementing a, compre a compression algorithm, the code is scrambled, so it, it's hidden. And it, it's not possible to simply load it into a decompiler or disassembler. You need to uh, capture from memory uh, a copy of the expanded executable. So this is another uh, trick that you can use. For example, check out if, uh, if many of you are uh, developing on Android or uh, also on Java, there are many, many Java decompilers out there. And uh, check if there are good, com uh, good packers, because this might make it a little bit more difficult uh, for the compilers to extract and to reach the original source code from the object code. It is another trick. Then there is code of obfuscation. Obfuscation is the process of transforming the decompiled disassembled source code unintelligible, but still executable, to dramatically increase the time required by the reverse engineer to understand the inner working, uh, working of the application. We have lexical obfuscation, for example, which is the name of the classes, methods, or variables uh, imagine when you're coding, you're using um, things to also, it is natural. We are trying to use names that say something to us. And so maybe we can call the procedure check if registered. This is a big, big mistake because maybe this check if registered will end up in the object code and it will be immediate for the reverse engineer to understand that that is the, the, the protection check. And so it's important to use uh, strings that are not so obvious. 
Then there is control obfuscation, which is insertion of ambiguous predicates, giving the illusion of a different flow in the execution of code. Um, this is a, a, a broad uh, topic, but it means that basically we are inserting into an application instructions that really don't do anything, but give the illusion to the reverse engineer that they might do something. For example, we can have an uh, an if statement. If uh, A is true, then um, B or C. Uh, the reverse engineer will assume that there are some times where you actually you reach C, but this never happens. We do it on purpose to make it more difficult to understand, and this is control obfuscation. It's a waste of time for the reverse engineer, and it might also be uh, exhausting. Then we have anti-debugging, and this is the last thing we will see, and then Maybe we we'll managed to show you how to uh, run a crack me file uh, in all the debug. Anti-debugging means that we include in the software some practice, such as detecting whether an application is run to a debugger, and preventing this debugging by neutralizing this debugger. Uh, I was telling you about soft ties. Soft ties, now it's a dead product, so we can also speak happily about this. Uh, this is how it was uh, detected and many applications back in the day when they detected that soft ties was running in memory they either went to a time, I mean they either exited the application, the application simply died some were even uh, more interesting, they actually were damaging the, the the hard drive of the, of the yeah, there, there were some nut cases who do, did and this. Software did this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There is a software. I guess it's Radiator. It's called. It's a, a a music application that was tampering with some people's hard drive. If it detected that you were running it into all the debugger, so some software. Yeah, some of yeah. This is illegal, of course. But then it, it goes into the fact that you have to admit that you were actually trying to reverse engineer this and you were not using a legit copy of the software. So it, it is a strange realm. And, but yeah, normally the application would simply exit or refuse to run into a debugger. Um, debuggers normally use these interrupts, which is interrupts one and three. These were used by soft ties. And these are for step uh, step uh, debugging. When uh, uh, the debugger will hook these ones, and so this is how it was detected that the 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 the, the, the descriptor table was actually hacked, and the vector was hooked by a debugger. And with this portion of code, it was pretty easy back <coughs> then to realize that the application was running through soft ties and then take some countermeasures. Okay, let's see something now and then I leave you which is this running this crack me file into can you see? Okay Maybe I don't need to, to be there. Um, so what is this? We were talking about the, the strings, right? What if we search for all the reference, referenced strings? Okay, now we are in NTDLL. <coughs> So we better single step a little bit. Now we're running the application in the debugger. You can see that we are jumping here. Okay.
you can see that this application, what it does is checks that you enter the correct password. This person, of course, uh, has not obfuscated the strings. The strings are clear. So you can see here that you have two strings into this object code. The first one is correct password. The second one is invalid password. So it might be wise to check out the portion of the code that is uh, playing with these strings. And we end up here. So tell me if you have troubles with assembly, if it's not clear. Is it difficult? It's a bit hard to read. Unusual. OK. See that what, what happens here, I will explain it to you. Here, the ASCII string, correct password, is pushed in the stack. And then a call is made. Here, the ASCII string invalid password is pushed in the stack. And then there is a, a call to the same routine. We might assume that eventually this is actually printing something. And then there is a jump somewhere else in the code. Then we also have an ASCII string for bad input. Now what we do is we try to understand when the application end up here and when it end up here. If you, if you see here, you will notice that actually this one is jumping at C9 and it will give us invalid password, right? Oh, interrupt me if you, do, if you cannot uh, follow, just interrupt me. So there is a G and Z in assembly means jump if not zero. When you f make a, a compare, and this is very important, if it's not zero, so if it's not equal, jump. This is what it's saying. And in fact, this must be the most important instruction in this, in this code. It comes right, uh, as you can see, we're starting from, from the end, from the output, and we are going backwards. This, why this compare is important? This compare is comparing an, a D word, a double word, to 64 in uh, um, hexadecimal. If this portion of memory is not equal to 64, what happens is we end up here and we have invalid password. If it's equal to uh, 64 hexadecimal, 100 decimal, we get correct password. Could it be that the password is 100? Let's try. So. If we enter this number, we will get an invalid password, which is exactly this string here. Right? Well, let me move it a little bit lower so you can see. If we enter something that is not, we are talking about numeric password. What, what if we enter some? We, we get bad input. What if we enter 100? We get correct password. So actually, we have cracked the application. We have wha, wha, how we got the serial number. This is, for example, imagine that now you are protecting your application and there is a passphrase, there is a, a special password that you only give to your users. And um, 
this is how it would be defeated. So, going back to the things that we have seen, how this application could have made it much more difficult. First off, well, we can go back to, to the presentation. I, I want to show you also the C++ code of this application. As you can see, it's very easy. This is the C++, maybe this might be a little bit more familiar to you. So you have these three options, bad input, correct password, and invalid password. And as you can see, normally when you crack an application, that you always have this kind of if statement, uh, which basically is translated into a compare in assembly. And then you have a jump to the execution of something, which is in this case set console text attribute and then a C out, which translates into these calls here. This is how the object code looks like. So we have seen some of the protections and let's go back and then we conclude. Encryption could have been used on the strings. So if the strings were encrypted even with a simple XOR cipher, it would have been much more difficult for me now to just go there and check and find immediately invalid password or wrong password or correct password or whatever. If the file was packed, uh, even with all the, all the debug, it would have been difficult. We would have had to be able to unpack with the debugger this application, which is more difficult. Uh, it is not impossible. It is possible, of course, but it starts to get more difficult. Then we could have been using obfuscation of code. If you see, here there was really no, no obfus obfuscation. When you search for constants or, uh, or, for example, when we were searching for uh, the strings, everything is pretty clear and also um, the, the, the call are, are pretty uh, evident. Then there is no anti-debugging trick. Now, for example, if you check on the internet about all the debug, every month, every once in a while, there are some new uh, flaws in this debugger found. And uh, a wise programmer can use these flows to his or her own advantage because some of these flows might have the only debug crash and so you make the debugger crash and uh, it's more difficult to get to where you want to, th that is reverse engineering so I think we have concluded. As you, as you understand, it is a very broad topic, and I try to keep it more, a little bit more generic. Yeah. Uh, how much impact does it have on performance? What? Um, uh, protection. For example, if we implement that, does it have any uh, Yeah, it will have a, an impact. It's like when you are basically packing and unpacking. Uh, um, with zip or rar a bunch of files, only that in this case once it's packed, it will be packed only once and then you will only have the, the time required for unpacking this code. But since normally executables are not uh, as huge as uh, you know, normal archives, we're talking about uh, files which are considerably smaller and currently computers have a very strong CPU so uh, I would say that normally the user is not affected, doesn't even notice. But yes, in the days of the PC XT, I once packed an application with Pickup Alight and the loading time went from uh, 20 seconds to one minute. But we're talking about a computer that is from uh, more than 20 years ago. Um. How does the increased complexity of software nowadays uh, interfere with reverse engineering? Because like this, this program was well, pretty simple actually. Yeah. 
but nowadays programs have like stack traces, like 150 stacks long, uh, and so on. Well, so you you, you don't have you only have to take care of the part, for example, that uh, handles. Uh, let's imagine you you have a shareware. What what people who release shareware have done in the in the last decade is this: they make uh, the full application and then they release it as shareware, and you can make the full the the, sh the let's say uh, shareware application full by inserting a serial number, for example. So you have to take care of these things. Anti-debugging tricks will be implemented anyway or anti-decompiler tricks. There are also anti-decompiler tricks which will make, for example, EDA, interactive disassembler crash. Th those will, will be uh, implemented anyway to protect a little bit your intellectual property and preventing others from copying some of your concepts. Encryption of the strings, well, that is required and it uh, could be done only on relevant strings. For example, you don't need to encrypt all the strings in, a, in an application. It could be okay to do so, but it, it, if you don't want to do that, only take care of those who are relevant in the protection scheme. Packing, uh, packing makes extremely difficult. We're talking about UPX, but there are other packers, and uh, PACE, which is commercial software, is one of those, which makes it extremely difficult to unpack executables and look into the code. Then obfuscation, of course, means also including garbage into this code. So you want to include garbage in the, in the code of the whole application? But, well, not really. Let's say just focus on those parts that you don't want to be easy to uh, reverse engineer. So that you really don't, uh, it doesn't take too long for you to, to work it out. And the Rails software has data for encryption and backing. Isn't that a problem um, if we use it in my code? What? Um, can, uh, generic uh, encryption and backing patterns in some of the Rails software. So if I use the technique, my software is maybe, um, yeah, maybe, maybe it's, uh, it's on the servers by the Rails software. You mean that if you implement your own techniques, you can uh, insert some errors in the code? No, no. Uh, it, the antivirus software thinks that my software is a virus. Ah, yeah, software. yeah. Um, yeah, this is common. This happens commonly. And uh, sometimes, because now antivirus softwares are not using those old schemes anymore. Back then, they were trying to find a string. And uh, when there was a match, they would tell you there is a virus. Now they are also using heuristics. And so there are many fa false positives when you find those kind of uh, encryption techniques. You only have to inform the users or eventually also get in touch with the software company producing antiviruses that there is no virus and actually the, the application really works that way. Yeah, it, that, it triggers false positives at times, but because it, it plays with uh, antivirus software heuristics. So your, your question is uh, on the spot, I think, yeah. And uh, it is like you say, but again, you also have to think about protecting yourself in a way or another. So you have to inform the users that they're running, for example, I guess, to, um, a number of antivirus softwares that there are false positives say on uh, Kaspersky or another one. Not all of them will uh, recognize your software as a virus. I have to interrupt you now. Um, thank you for your okay. very interesting talk. Um, please now change very quickly to the room you like to attend. In this room there will be the rules for the Android Hackathon and in the other rooms there will be a talk about Selenium. And after, the, after these talks, please wait outside the rooms. Um, we have an after party and we'll explain everything outside the... Yeah.